Thank you, Jesus, our Saviour. Thank you for your great love for us. Help us to learn more about your love now as we look at your word and as we listen to your voice. We pray that we would hear you speaking directly to our hearts and that we might know and love you and trust you more. We thank you. Amen. Amen. Do sit down. And um, we're looking at Mark chapter 6. So if you'd like to take your Bibles and uh, open at Mark chapter 6. And I'm going to read uh, verses 1 to 6. Part of the wider passage and uh, verses that we're looking at this week, um, if you're follow, following the, uh, the reading plan through the Mark's book, um, then this week we're looking at the whole of chapter 6. Um, and I've entitled today, Trusting the True King. And we'll see, uh, we'll reflect on some of those later verses, but mainly following verses 1 to 6. So I'll read it from Mark's Gospel. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offence at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour, except in his hometown, among his own relatives and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few people who were ill and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Last week, um, when we were uh, looking at our verses together, we, we looked at Jesus' power over all types of chaos. Lots of different types of chaos that we, we experience in the world. And we saw how Jesus calmed a storm, having complete control and sovereignty over nature. But we also saw in some of those other verses as well, Jesus' authority over the demons, the spirit world. Jesus' authority over sickness and illness. And his authority over our biggest enemy, death. And we marveled last week at Jesus' wonderful grace in not only having the power over these things, but also having a good purpose to use his power for. And so as we see Jesus bringing in God's kingdom, our series that we're looking at through Mark's gospel is called Your Kingdom Come. And as we see Jesus bringing in the kingdom, he reveals to us that he is the king. He is the true king for us to trust, a powerful king and a good king. And so we come to these verses today thinking about how we can trust in the true king. We're going to work under three headings, okay? Thinking about trusting the true king. One, Jesus the king returns home. Two, Jesus the king is both God and man. And three, Jesus the king responds to faith. So let's start at verses one and two. Jesus the king returns home. So Jesus, we've been seeing, has been... Um, with his disciples performing these amazing miracles, they've experienced his power and now he takes them back to Nazareth, his hometown. What we noted a few weeks ago was although um, Jesus uh, grew up in Nazareth, spent his first 30 years there probably, he then moved to Capernaum later on when he started his ministry. But here he returns home, Nazareth, his hometown. I wonder how you feel about your hometown. Or what home, the, the image of home, what does that bring up for you? What is home for you? I wonder if you've got great affection for what you believe home is. When you think about home, you have great memories of your upbringing and great experiences and you look fondly back at, at what home really is. Or maybe for you, actually, home is a painful experience. That actually it wasn't a happy time growing up and that the whole thought process of what home is, is is hard it's painful for you lots of songs and uh, things that we can read about home aren't there lots of lots of songs about what home is like um, Adele is the multi-winning multi-award winning artist singer songwriter and her very very first song that she wrote was called hometown glory it was written um, in response to her mum who was pres putting pressure on her to go and study and move away to university and so she wrote this song about what home meant to her. 
in the, the chorus, the words of the chorus are, are this. Round my hometown, memories are fresh. Round my hometown, the people that I've met are the wonders of my world. Memories of home, what it means to people. Some people live in the same area all their lives. I wonder if that's you. Or I wonder if you've moved around a bit. But this is where you happen to be now. Whatever you ex have experienced, um, when you've returned to family or returned to home, I wonder what reception you've got. How have people treated you when you've gone back to a home situation? Or you've gone back to family or relatives? How have people welcomed you? And have people let you grow up? <laughs> or when you came back, were you sort of treated in a way that you were treated 20, 30, 40 years ago? And people didn't actually it, it allow you to grow and mature. I wonder. I wonder if you were limited by people's expectations of you. I wonder what church is like for you as well. In church life, have you been allowed to grow and mature? Have people, have people let you develop here? to express your gifts? Or do you feel perhaps boxed in by people's perceptions of who they think you are rather than who you believe you are? Home. What does Jesus experience when he returned home? Let's have a look at it, verses 1 to 2. Um, it, it says here, Jesus left and went home with his disciples, um, accompanied um, to his hometown, sorry, accompanied by his disciples. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed. He began to teach in the synagogue. We noted a few weeks ago that Jesus, because of the reputation that he'd been gaining, and some of those religious leaders were uh, actually very suspicious of him and very anti him because they thought he was a threat to them, he was a nuisance, he was, he was trouble, that he'd been rejected by, uh, to, by speaking in the synagogues. He'd been banned. So actually he was in the open air now, and we saw him speaking in parables to the crowds and the reaction that he got. But Nazareth was a little way away from those places. Maybe it was a little bit isolated in its location. And perhaps news about Jesus and what he'd been up to hadn't properly reached Nazareth yet. There wasn't much opinion about Jesus either as a hero or as a villain. And so Jesus returned home and the way to the synagogue was open for him. So there he was, in the synagogue, standing, reading, teaching. Probably, uh, as he did in other places, he took a scroll and he would have looked and read through some words from one of the Old Testament prophets. And as he did that, he would have interpreted them and described how the kingdom of God was now with them in his presence and how it was being fulfilled. And most probably, as in other situations, other accounts that we've read, Jesus also showed his authority not simply by his teaching, but also by his authority over evil spirits. We saw him driving out a demon in a synagogue in Capernaum and maybe doing other miracles as well. And there's a response. Many people who heard him were amazed, it says in verse 2. Where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? There was amazement from these people who saw Jesus with their own eyes and they heard his voice. It brought a reaction out of them. Jesus was home. These were his hometown people. Initially, they responded with amazement. Jesus, is, Jesus the king is both God and man. Because let's carry on to verse 3. What initially seems to impress the people standing there, the, 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 the people in the synagogue, what's impressive, suddenly it seems to turn to disbelief. Can you see the change in verse 3? They're, they're amazed by his miracles, by the words coming out of his mouth, but then they say, hold on, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James and... Judas and Joseph and Simon, aren't his sisters here with us? These people start to reason away what is right in front of them. Rather than judge Jesus by what they see and experience, rather than trying to work out, hold on, what is this telling us? What is God doing amongst us in our midst here? How can we trust God more by seeing this Jesus? Who is he? Who can we understand him to be? Actually, rather than opening their understanding 
And rather than widening their expectations and, and actually widening their view of God, actually they do the opposite. They start limiting. And they start narrowing. And they start to draw their own conclusions. And the tragedy here is that they fail to see Jesus for who he really is. Being the place where Jesus was from, they would have known him from a young boy. They would have seen him grow up. They would have seen him learn a trade. Carpentry here is more than just woodwork. It's, it's a craftsman who works with all kinds of different materials, metal and timber and uh, stonework. So Jesus would have been involved in making all sorts of things, like working on houses even and plows and furniture and all sorts. A, cra a, a craftsman, a skilled craftsman. They would have seen him learn that trade. Of course, they would have known his family. He knew his mum and his brothers and sisters. Don't mention his dad here. We, we presume Joseph was dead by then. But they were so fixed when they saw Jesus return home. They were so fixed on his humanity that they couldn't see his divinity. They couldn't see that this one before them could be more than who they thought he was. And verse 3 actually tells us Quite strong words. They took offence at him. They took offence at him. Can a man who comes from a normal family that we've seen grow up, he can't be God, surely. He can't be more than we want him to be or expect him to be. It's too much to accept. Can't handle it. So they narrow their view. They thought they knew who Jesus was. They thought they knew, but they got it wrong. Seeming familiarity here. They thought they were familiar. They weren't. They got it wrong. But seeming familiarity can grow contempt. That's what was going on here, wasn't it? Took offense at Jesus. Some people today do the same thing. And when, they, when they get an idea of who they think Jesus is, start limiting him rather than actually wanting to expand their understanding or expand their, their thinking on him. So lots of people can think, well, maybe there was a Jesus that walked the earth. Maybe there was someone who did and said great things, good things. He was a good man. But they stopped short at accepting that Jesus is God. Muslims believe Jesus to be a great prophet. But absolutely they don't believe that he is the son of God, God himself. They don't believe that. Mahatma Gandhi, the, the Indian peace activist, he was really... Um, uh, he really looked up to Jesus, admired him. This is what he said about Jesus. He said, what then does Jesus mean to me? To me, he was one of the greatest teachers humanity has ever had. <laughs> but he stopped short at believing that Jesus was God. See, C.S. Lewis said, look, when you look at the life of Jesus, he does not leave open to us the possibility of him being just a man. He doesn't. Because Jesus in himself, the things he did and said, we have to draw another conclusion than he was just a great teacher. Either Jesus was a liar by some of the things that he said. He claimed to be someone who he knew he wasn't. He was a liar and he was trying to deceive us. Or Jesus was mixed up in his own head. He thought he was great, but he was delusional and actually he was a bit mad. Or the, the only other conclusion that you can draw is that Jesus truly is God because the things that he did and the things that he said can only point us to that conclusion. So what is he? Is it important for us as Christians, is it important for anybody to believe that Jesus is fully God and fully man? Do you think that's important? I would say it is. It's absolutely crucial because our salvation depends on it. This is why. See, Christians, they fought in the first few centuries, there were, there were lots of controversies about the nature of who Jesus was. And they fought really, really hard to defend this, this foundational truth that Jesus is fully God, fully man. And it's reflected in the creeds. If you read some of those creeds that, that we've inherited from, from the early days, actually they, they, um, they express those truths in them about, about who Jesus is. Athanasius, um, a bishop from Alexandria, wrote a fantastic piece of work, it's quite short, and it's actually really readable. If you, um, okay, it's translated into English, that makes it very readable. Uh, but um, it's a really good piece. It's called On the Incarnation. And he talks about 
how Jesus had to be man and God at the same time. And he corrected some of those um, uh, heresies from the 4th century that were, were, were speaking about Jesus not being fully God. But here's why. Here's why it's important. Our sin, our rejection of God, brings a curse on us. It brings a penalty. God has given us a penalty to pay. And I have to pay for my sin. I'm responsible for my actions. I am responsible for the sin that I have made in my life. I'm responsible for rejecting God. And guess what? So are you. You're responsible for your own sin too. And so each of us has the penalty to pay for the crime that we've committed. We have to face that for ourselves. Nothing we can do. I cannot take your sin from you because I have my own to pay. And you cannot take mine has to be paid and God is a just God he has to he has to meet out the punishment for sin so is there any hope because you see if there was hope by believing that actually God could say look um, I'll cancel your sin and um, as long as you're sorry it's okay um, I'll wipe it away I will forget all about it that might seem a very kind thing to do but actually that's not just it's not just we know that from our own, uh, our own legal system. It wouldn't be just just to let everyone walk away from their, the penalty of their crime. We know that, that the penalty has to be paid. The price has to be paid. So is there any hope for us? This is God's masterstroke. God's masterstroke is that he came and he chose to come to earth himself. He would become a man. But he would be the perfect man. Jesus, as he came, he walked the earth as a true man. He was fully man, but he was the only man who never sinned, never did anything wrong. He lived the perfect life, and he demonstrated it. He showed everyone by his love and compassion, his perfection, but also his power. We've seen that, haven't we, over the last few weeks? The person of Jesus. And Jesus would call people to turn back to God and to come back to him through his message. And ultimately, he would call people back to God through the cross. It was through the cross that Jesus, the perfect man who had no sin to pay of his own, could take on our sin by being there himself. It was the way that he could be fully God and fully man at the same time, and not just take our sin, but defeat our sin and pay for it. He had to be both through the cross. Corinthians tells us this, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let's follow that courtroom situation out with the illustration, right? So you're in the court. You're standing there. Okay, this could be the dock, couldn't it, right? So we're standing here in the dock and I'm guilty as charged and the judge sits across from me God himself. He sits across and he knows I'm guilty and I know I'm guilty. And there's no way out. The penalty has to be paid. But imagine this. This is what happened when Jesus came down to earth. The judge sitting opposite takes off his wig. Puts down his gavel. Takes off his robe. And he walks over to the dock. And he looks at us in the eye and he says... I'm going to take your place. If you want to walk free, I'll pay for you. Pay for your sin. And there is the offer. The great offer that Jesus made as he came down to earth. He said, if you want to walk free, you can walk free because I'm going to stand in your place. And on the cross, that's what Jesus did. Jesus paid the price for us. And in his divinity and in his humanity, he could do that. God Fully God, fully man, Jesus Christ. And it is a wonderful thing. And we offer this regularly and we say, if you haven't yet understood or if you haven't yet come to that point of accepting the fact that you can walk free from that dock into that freedom of life, then Jesus has offered that to you. And if you haven't yet accepted it, you can accept it today. You can say sorry for your sin and you can accept that offer of new life in Christ. Do you know what? 
Those people, as they stood there in Nazareth, they had the chance to see Jesus for who he really was. But the problem was, they couldn't. They couldn't do it. It was too much for them. It was too much for them to either comprehend, comprehend or to want to accept that Jesus was fully God, fully man. And they took offence at him. Do you know that, that little phrase, they took offence at him, it literally means they stumbled over him. They tripped up. He was a stumbling block to them. You know, God prophesied that Jesus would be a stumbling block to many. Prophet Isaiah said that he, Jesus, would be a stone that causes many to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. It's true, isn't it? Many people won't accept Jesus. He's a stumbling block because they can't accept that he truly is God who came to earth to pay for our sin, to bring us to God and to have life in his name. It's great news for us. But for so many, they struggle with it. They can't accept it. Peter reminds us of those very words in the New Testament in one of his letters. But he also contrasts with another truth, a very, very important truth for us, that those who recognize Jesus as both king and saviour, rather than being a stumbling block, what is he? He's our cornerstone. See, I lay a stone in Zion a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. What a difference that is. This stone, you either trip over it or he's the foundation to your life. That's the difference that Jesus makes. Oh, for Jesus to be the foundation for us, he's the one who holds us together, he's the one who makes sense of every situation for us. Keep trusting in him. Keep trusting in Jesus. Whatever's happened this week, whatever's going on for you, whatever might come, keep hold of him because surely he keeps hold of you. He is the king. He is the rock. He is the firm foundation, I promise you. Have joy to know Christ. The cross is foolishness to those who won't believe. But to us who are being saved, it is the wisdom of God. Jesus is fully God, fully man, and he loves us so much. But here's the last thing to look at this morning, is that Jesus the King responds to faith. Look at verses 4 to 6. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour except in his hometown, among his relatives and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. You know, in the stories that precede this one in in chapter 5, we see Jesus commending that woman. Do you remember that woman who was bleeding for 12 years and she came to him in faith, believing that he could heal her, and he did. He commends her for her faith. Jairus, who comes to Jesus because his daughter is dying, Jesus says, don't be afraid, just believe. Believe in me. Don't just look at the circumstances that you're in and be dictated by them, but believe in me, trust in me. So Jesus is urging people and commending them for their faith. Jesus, in his hometown in Nazareth, was amazed at their lack of faith. Can you see the word amazed comes up twice in our reading? Yeah, Because the people were amazed at Jesus when, when they looked at him and they saw him, but it wasn't an amazement that led to faith. In fact, In the end, it was an amazement that led to disbelief. But Jesus said, I can't believe that that you're still not believing. Seems amazing, doesn't it? Time and time again through the Gospels, we'll see it again in two weeks' time when we return to Mark after our Lord's Supper, that we see another example of someone putting their faith in Jesus and seeing him transform their situation because of their faith in him. But here, there was a lack of faith. Not just a lack of faith from the locals who dismissed him, but can you see even a lack of faith in his own household, his own family, didn't even believe or trust in him properly. Remember back in chapter 3, if you've been reading through Mark, um, a section we didn't really focus on in our our talks, but you might have read it, that that actually when Jesus' family came to find him, they thought he was out of his mind. 
What did they want him to do? Just return back to his normal life, his carpentry and his just day job? I don't know. But Jesus was really clear. He was really clear to point out that to be part of his family was about faith, having faith in him. It wasn't about bloodlines or anything. It wasn't about growing up um, as a Jew particularly, but it was about receiving the promises of God by faith that are fulfilled in Jesus Christ, in himself. That's what counts. And here, the lack of faith resulted then in Jesus not doing many miracles there. Now, it wasn't that people's lack of faith had any particular power over Jesus, as if the faith itself has the power. It wasn't that, but it was more about Jesus responding to whether people wanted him or not. Do you want me? Do you want me to show you more of myself? Do you want me to transform your lives and your situation? They didn't. So he didn't. It's a question for us, isn't it? Do we want Jesus to transform us? Do we put our faith in him and, and trust that he has the power and, and, and actually wants to bring that change about in our lives? That's the question, isn't it? I wonder if um, you've been a Christian a long time and whether Jesus seems very familiar to you. Or almost so familiar that the name Jesus can lose his power. Or Jesus himself, we, we think we know him so much that we decide what we think he can or can't do in our lives. We say, well, Jesus might be able to help me with this, but he can't help me with that. We get so familiar with him that we actually limit and our faith diminishes rather than expands. Surely getting to know Jesus more and more should help us to trust him more and actually to expand our view of what he can do. Look back at the things that he's done in your life in the past. Can you think of some times when he's powerfully worked in your life, in your heart, to change something in you or to transform a situation that you've faced and you've praised him for it and you've said, wow, thank you for helping me. And yet as time goes on, sometimes we lose that. We, we lose that faith to believe that he can bring that change. What is that? What is that? Is it because we look and are disappointed by things in life more? Is it because we, um, we, we look at circumstances around us and everything seems too big and we've got our, our eyes fixed on them rather than we have on him? Could be lots of reasons, couldn't there? But I want to encourage you today. If there's something, some area of your life that you've not given over to him, that you're holding on to, either because you think it's too big for him or you're not willing to go through that process of him bringing that change or transformation because maybe it's too painful for you, please, please don't hang on to it. Be prepared to hand over everything in your life to him and trust that he can do something special. And he can bring that change. Even if you've been a Christian a long time, whatever season of life you're in at the moment, don't restrict Jesus and say, oh, um, he can't do anything special with me now. He did then, he might do in the future, but now, no. John Altberg quoted him a few weeks ago. Sarah's reading a book on him at the moment and uh, she's got lots of good quotes from me from John Oakbrook, but this is what he says. He says, our season of life, whatever it is, is no barrier to having Christ formed in us. Not in the least. Whatever our season of life, it offers us its own opportunities and challenges for spiritual growth. Instead of wishing we were in another season, he says, we ought to find out what this one offers. Life counts. All of it. Every moment is potentially an opportunity to be guided by God in, into his way of living. Every moment is a chance to learn from Jesus how to live in the kingdom of God. So every moment. So don't wish this season away. If you're going for a hard season, don't wish it away. What is God doing now? What does Jesus want to do now in your life? What's he teaching you? How does he want to transform you? How does he want to work through this process to bring about something much more powerful than if he just took it away completely? What is he doing in us? And what do we want him to do in us? Trust in the true king. 
through the rest of the chapter, we see lots of things going on to do with Jesus' kingship. You know, in contrast to the lack of faith in Nazareth, Jesus then sends his disciples out to the villages surrounding. And we see a very different experience that they have as they preach, as they drive out demons, they see people healed. Presumably, the faith in the surrounding villages was greater than the faith in his hometown. Good things happened. Later on in the chapter, we see the worldly King Herod selfishly serving himself. Great banquet, eating and gorging, making a rash promise which results in the, the death of John the Baptist. Contrast that to the wonderful King Jesus, who in thousands of people who are sitting there wanting to be fed, rather than Jesus being selfish and gorging himself as King Herod did, actually he was generous and wonderful and magnificent in providing a feast for everyone. Jesus is life-giving, isn't he? He's the true king. He's the shepherd. He talked about being the shepherd of the sheep. He's come to be our shepherd to lead us to God. And through all of these experiences, he's continually teaching his disciples in public, the feeding of the 5,000, the disciples see and experience Jesus more. In private, it's another experience of them being on the water in a storm and Jesus walking on the water and actually testing their faith out again. Public and private, Jesus is teaching his disciples, growing them, being patient with them, working in them doing the same for us isn't he isn't he amazingly patient with us don't you think more than we are with each other isn't he good to us he's working in us he wants us to trust him come to him trust him as you trust him you'll see him work more in your life I'm sure he will. Jesus is the true king. And as we come to him today, we can trust that his kingship will rule in our hearts, in our lives, through us, individually, together as families, and together as the family of God. In Paul's Grove, witnessing to those around us to reflect him more. Well, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the true king. We thank you that you are even greater than our expectations of you. You're greater than our minds can comprehend. But I pray that we wouldn't limit you, that we wouldn't limit you by who we think you are, but we would open ourselves up to who you want to show us you really are. So Lord Jesus, for us who perhaps haven't taken that step of faith to put our trust in you as our saviour, please help us. If there are some today that need to do that, help us to do that. To realise that you are fully God, fully man who came to rescue from sin and to bring people back to God. Please help us to respond today. Lord, if there are areas of our lives that we haven't given over to you because we think that you can't deal with them, perhaps things from many, many, many years we think things are too big for you. Lord, please correct us. Please help us. Please help us to give those things over to you. To trust you as the king of all things and of all situations and of every season. Thank you, Jesus, that you are our cornerstone who holds our lives together. The sure foundation, the one in whom we can depend. We praise you and thank you. Amen.